Hello, welcome to School of Alchemy. Today's book is Hilma Afklin Paintings for the Future. We studied Hilma Afklin's life and painting for the whole three months course. Uh, so uh, this is my take on it. So this book is hardbound. I really like this. It's very well bounded and it's durable because uh, this book suffered <laughs> a lot of uh, moving, falling and everything, but it's still intact. It's still very much intact. This is published by the Guggenheim, which also exhibits her works and paintings. This book is quite heavy, okay? Which is, I like. <laughs> so let's go in. I like the contrast of red and blue. And then they show this. It makes sense to me. So I'm not gonna go over the table of contents because it will take a while, but I'm going to bring you to the meat, the important part, for me at least. So, these are one of the paintings. You get like 1,200 paintings and diagrams, notebooks, lectures, everything. So, this is important for me. So we will understand uh, Hilma Afklin's painting. By 1896, Afklin was meeting regularly with a group of four women to conduct sciences and pursue a meaningful spiritual path. So Anna Kaysel, Afklin's friend from the Royal Academy, Cornelia Sederberg, Sigrid Hedman, and Mathilde, whose surname is unknown. So the activities of the five, the femme, as they call themselves, would profoundly impact of Afklin's artistic practice. Weekly meetings took place at the homes and studios of the members and were structured not unlike a traditional church service to include Bible readings, sermons, and benedictions. Furniture was arranged so that the participant knelt around an altar. The five believed that, the communi that they communicated with and received messages from beings of higher consciousness by entering trance state or using a psychograph. The guides or high masters, the hoga, identified themselves as Amaliel, Ananda, Clemens, Esther, George, and Gregor, and led the group in their spiritual training as the women ventured beyond their external reality in the realms of in the realms unseen. So Amaliel Amaliel is the guide of Hilma of Clint. So So this is the sketch of, of the forms of Amaliel, Ananda, George, and Gregor. So these are the forms of their guides, the higher power. So now you understand that their painting is, it says that their painting came from the higher power. It's being guided. It's not from their own, but it's they're being guided, but by a spiritual entity. So, I'm just gonna flip this over and then we will jump to this. This is from the altar pieces. You see uh, this one, you can see that it's the planet Saturn with the ring 
and then she incorporated uh, astrology. And this one at the middle, there are two human beings. You need a magnifying glass to see this, you know. These beings, the two beings, they w they're wearing a halo, you know, like painting of saints and Jesus. This one, they have no halo yet. So it seems like this is like a dark. Uh, I'm, this is not, what I'm saying is not according to the book. This is my own take. This is my own opinion. So this is like uh, maybe a normal, regular life. And this is when you get spiritual enlightenment. That's, that's why for me, I think, because it's gold. The dove. As you can uh, notice, uh, Hilma's painting is not only abstract, which is she is known for, but she also uses geometric paintings and layers and cubes, which is really cool for me. See? She uses geometric shapes, but there's a, there is a meaning behind all of this, okay, which is explained in this book. So I really recommend you purchase this book because you will see paint, you will see her painting in a different light, not just looking at it, but you will understand the meaning behind it. This is from the swan. This is the swan. So for me, I uh, interpret this as the yin and yang. You know, the eastern yin and yang, the black and the white. Because she believed in duality. Like this. Okay, this is the tree of knowledge. It looks like the Yggdrasil tree, right? The tree of life. This. And there are two swans underneath. Amazing, amazing idea. I really like her ideas. How she portrayed it. It's once again, the tree of life. Tree of knowledge, I mean. So it reminds me of Kabbalah. So this is the altar used by the five group that would read from Bible before ch channeling. So they used, they kneel on this altar and they channel the spirits, which I mentioned earlier. Beautiful. So it is said that uh, although Vasily Kadinsky is the famous one in abstract spiritual painting, but uh, Hilma F. Clint predated him five years. But since she requested for her paintings to be published 20 years after her death. So we didn't hear about her paintings. That's why this is the title, Paintings for the Future, because uh, she wanted it published 20 years after she passed away. Evolution. So these are one of the big paintings that you will see at the Guggenheim. Beautiful. Child. So she named this childhood. Youth. Adulthood, Adulthood. 
adulthood. And this one is the cover. It's really beautiful. Uh, also, you know, although she's very known for her paintings, I really like her diagrams. You know, she created diagrams like this, like the swatches. These are chromatic. You can see. These are not like, uh, these are not the basic colors. These are chrome. And imagine she painted this in the 1800s. <laughs> Look at that, huh? How cool. So, let's read a paragraph. It says here that, uh, can you see? We tend to associate, I'm here. We tend to associate diagrams with modern scientific or mathematical methods. Diagrams are schematic drawings that serve as a rational tool to show how things work. But in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the diagram... Okay. I don't know if you could see it, guys. You know, I have a poor lighting here. The diagram was just as much feature as an was just as much a feature of an occult spiritual guide as it was of a scientific textbook. Cosmic diagrams and tabulations, though they harked back to the ancient cosmologies and sacred geometries, filled the pages of the modern occult press and other esoteric publication. They drew on pre-modern conventions from Eastern philosophies, Rosicrucianism, alchemy, and myriad other sources, and mimicked modern scientific discoveries from Edwin D. Babbitt's alternative color therapies in the principles of light and color. So, uh, Annie Besant and Lee Bitter created uh, a book called Thought Forms. These are like, uh, they draw how our thoughts are being, um, you know, when you're thinking about something, it's like a thought, right? But they have like a sketch of the thoughts, which is cool. Like this. Illustration from Annie Besant and the reader called Chemistry a series of clairvoyant observation on the chemical elements. Right, right on. How cool is that, right? These are thought forms. And you think the occult people are just into occult spirituality. They are artists too. They are great artists, philosophists, engineers. They have their own profession, which are, they're very great, great on it. But at the same time, they have other call practices too, like George Washington, right? He's the father of the Freemason. So Parsifal. Parsifal series. I like this too. Parsifal is one of the knights in the King King Arthur's not King Ar Knight of the Oh, I forget the name. King Arthur in the Knight of the Round Table. Beautiful. I like it. These are watercolors. Another A series of clairvoyant observations in on the chemical elements.
nice. It says here, the si science and occultism in Hilma Afglin's time and in her work. So, read this book, guys. Read this book. You will learn many things. Here are the exhibit of her paintings. Art abstract painting in Los Angeles County Museum. These are the exhibit in Stock Stockholm. Installation view, Hilma Afklin, a pioneer of abstraction Moderna Musit, Stockholm, February 16 to May 26, 2013. Okay. So this is important. This part is important. I want, if, if ever you're going to buy this book or you had this book before, but you did not bother to read this part, I recommend that you read the chronology of Hilma F. Clint because this is how you understand how she come up with all these paintings. So in the late, so she was born 1862. This is her picture when she was young. And then I'm gonna jump. In the late 1800, 1880s, she went to the Royal Academy, located near Kungstragen area, the heart of Stockholm's art sciences, art scene, sorry, art scene. And her studio is situated in the upper floors of the building that houses Blanche's art salon, where Edvard Munch will have an exhibition in 1894. She paints portraits and landscape in a naturalistic style. And then in 1889, this is where her uh, occultism started. In 1889, the Swedish Lodge of Theosophical Society is founded in Stockholm at the home of the writer Victor Rydberg. Afklin joins the society the same year. So this is where it all started. This is her again. She's a modern woman <laughs> in the 1900s. And then uh, this is one of the, her mentor, Rudolf Steiner. So this is, this is Gerstianum. This uh, this was built and designed by Rudolf Steiner. He is a theosophist and also a painter, an architect, a philosopher. It was in Dornak. And unfortunately, it burned down, but uh, they restored it. Lately, I mean, in, in the in the twentieth century, twenty first century. So in Dornach, Hilma researches in the archives of Anthropo Anthroposophical Society, but fails to find materials that would help her understand significance of her imagery. No painting exists from this year. So. Let me see, let me see, hold on. Man, this book is so heavy and uh, I'm in an odd position. It's kind of hard for me. Oh man. This, this is her notebook. Hilma writes in her notebook that her work should not be shown for 20 years 
after her death. She also undertakes a years-long process of making sure her works will be accessible to future generations. Oh, sorry. Ah, you didn't see what I'm reading. Uh, reorganizing and editing her notes and the notes of the five documenting her paintings and her works on paper. So this is the notebook where she stated that uh, her painting should not be uh, shown not until 20 years after her death. And uh, before we end this, I want to read this one, this part. I'm reading here. Although pred predicated on genuine interest, modern occultism's interaction with science can also be related to science's eminent status and legitimating power. The appropriation of concepts, the atom or rhetoric experiment observation could add an air of legitimacy to occult practice as well as mainstream science's increasing claim to a monopoly on delineating reality that is, to being the only proper route to knowledge in a, a correct worldview, invited disputing even subverting responses from occult groups which investigated and put more faith in the alternative routes to and forms of knowledge, construction, and production. So, as always, even in the 18th century, I mean, it, even in the 1800, the sciences is discounting spirituality. You know, like the atheists, they, they don't believe that there's a creator or a higher power or a divine being. And they, uh, they just uh, discounted and reduced everything in science. That's why, that's the reason why Carl Jung and Freud uh, broke up because Freud is very uh, more empirical. And also, you know, he thinks everything is about sex. <laughs> I mean, motivated in, in sex. But uh, Carl Jung believes that uh, there's, some, there's something more than science. That's why he created this, his collective works. And, you know, until today... <laughs> The people are divided between Freudian and Jungian psychology. So in, in my next uh, video, I'm going to talk about C.G. Jung dreams. You're going to love this. If you like dreams, pay attention to your dreams, like Jordan Peter said, because your dreams is telling something about you. And then these are the exhibition history. Her works has been exhibited in different venues in different countries. Okay, there you go. So I really recommend this book. So thanks for watching. I appreciate you for taking time to watch my video. And I hope you learned something. Okay, till next week. Bye.